Sorry, I'm just trying to let, let the flow of people yeah, in at the same time. <laughs> So um, why, why are we interested in diagnostic and feedback? We're not really a, a tools um, supplier. That's not our main business, but it really is uh, part of our work uh, with our clients. And because that's rooted in um, our coaching methodology and this idea that uh, diagnosis and feedback can really initiate uh, uh, or be, be, be serve as the beginning of an introspective journey uh, for self-evaluation. So it's really sort of a tool to trigger insights and to sort of um, enhance the conversations with the, uh, with the clients that we have. And the, this, this sort of self-exploration centered on 360 feedback or any of our other diagnostic tools can really be can really help focus the executives either individually or as groups to really confront issues um, that they face uh, within their practice. Um, so, um, we, over the years, we've developed a number of diagnostics, I think over 30 years. So if you have 30 years of experience or 20, maybe 20 years of experience developing and design, designing, developing diagnostics, um, to help both individuals, individual leaders, teams, and organizations. Um, and broadly our solutions include, um, stakeholder interviews. We have protocols for that. Um, psychometrically validated 360 tools. So those are 360 feedback. They engage the um, responses and perspectives, not only of the individual, but people around them. Um, it, it lends a more holistic view of the individual. Oh, we also have an immersive simulation on group dynamics. We offer also additional data analysis um, and we, are, we have the capability of providing client specific diagnostics, but under certain conditions. So that's when you know, a client has a particular need. There are, and there are some conditions under which we can um, also incorporate um, their particular, let's say, um, dimensions into the analysis. So just to give you a sense of our history, our very rich history is very, um, but just as an overview, I think we just wanna highlight that this is uh, the journey. It really, it started with KDVI, it really started with Manfred's work at INSEAD in 1971. So really showing you that there is a really uh, a trajectory of our work uh, with the diagnostics. Uh, and really the, the first tool was uh, designed and created in 2003 with the GLI. Some of you might be familiar with it, that was used in NCI. And so over the course of the years, at least 20 years, we've been developing and also fine tuning our tools. So our tools are not fixed. So we're always constantly um, trying to find ways to improve them. We take feedback, we might renormalize the tools. So at, at certain points in time, we will look back at our tools and, and, um, and get the feedback and try to integrate feedback from users um, to try to improve it. Um, so just to give you a sense of our diagnostics, um, we have diagnostics. So we take a very holistic view approach to, um, to diagnose diagnostics. So we offer um, or at least we, we work with clients at multiple levels. So it's not surprising that, you know, then we also have tools at different levels. Um, so we have tools at the leadership level. So that's really working with the individual leader. Um, and there are four tools. They're, they consist of the interviews and 360s. I will go through these in more detail. Um, in the next section, you can also find a lot of information on each of these tools on our website. But I wanted to sort of give you a sense that we, we really intervene at different levels and for each level we have a particular <coughs> service or diagnostic. And there's no one way of entering, you know, one way of using the tools. I think we always start with where the client is and then we, meet, we match the client need to a particular service. Um, so we really start from really the diagnostics, the interviews. Can you hear me? Um, so let's see. Um, oh, there's someone. I'm going to go through, I think, beyond anything, the tools. For us, a tool is just a tool. I think what sets us apart, or at least what we're very proud of in our work, is how we use the tool. 
And how do we debrief it? You know, how do we use the results with our clients? And I think that is a point that I would like to highlight on the way we use our tools, because there are a lot of tools out in the market you know, that address individual leadership development, team dynamics, or even organizational culture. And I think here, um, what I would like to just share with you is through the course of our work, also anchored in Manifest work um, and the psychodynamic systemic approach, but really how do we use uh, the information um, with the client? So really our approach of using diagnostics is not so much, um, and I don't actually really like the word diagnostic because it seem, seems really judgmental, but I think we really use it as a sense-making tool with the client. So it's a way to present some information and together we, with the client, we sense-make together. Um, and the goal really is to create greater self-awareness. And we like to use the Jahari window as a, a metaphor um, for what we do. So we're really trying to reveal information about oneself from the feedback. And the goal is really to um, create moments or, uh, you know, insights or uh, moments of clarity uh, where they, they are able to go and look at the behavior and try to understand why they behave the way they do, not only on their, with their own behavior, but in relationship to others. In a really systemic, uh, you know, more of a holistic way. So, you know, the Johari window, it's really, you know, what's your public self? Um, what you manifest to others or know to others and both to yourself. So that's your sort of very exquisite self, transparent self. Um, we're also interested in blind spots. So these are areas that might not be, that might be known to others, but not yourself. So I think partly the way we use the tools is to reveal these blind spots, uh, areas that we're not aware of. Um, and that's where the 360 becomes quite powerful because they lend us an additional lens or perspective. Um, then there's also the private, uh, the areas that are known to yourself, but not to others. And that's what we call the private self or the secret garden. So there are things that you keep in your inner life. Um, that's just part of your own, you know, um, personality, your dreams, your aspirations. And I think when possible, it's also, it's also an area to tap into in some of our coaching conversations, because they, they actually dig deep into um, personal values, drivers, motivations. Um, and then finally, there's this area that we don't touch in our practice, which is the unconscious, which we give, we assign to the, you know, um, psychologists or psychiatrists, but the unconscious. So it's really trying to work in these realms, not just only on the surface level, but trying to dig deeper into different facets of their uh, personality, their inner drivers, the motivations, and really going deeper with the information that we have. Um, I'll open it up for questions later um, after these two slides. And then um, another part of our approach, and for some of, them, for some of you who already are familiar with uh, Manfred's work, uh, we use a psychodynamic lens. And what we mean by this, as mentioned, is that we're really interested in the, in the, motiv motiv in the motivations of human behavior. So not just explicit behavior, so something that I do, but really what are the drivers of that behavior? So really going much deeper. So psych by psychodynamic, we re it means that we explore the reasons that underlie human actions within oneself, with others, and also within organizations. Collectively, you can also apply the psychodynamic lens um, because we recognize that people are complex, unique, and paradoxical with you know, very different and sometimes conflicting motivational drives. And I think when we work at this level of complexity, then we're able to then understand more why there are resistances to change. Um, and then looking at the, beneath the surface, we can then examine the emotional and psychological aspects of an individual's lives and the drivers, complexities, tensions within. If you're interested in this approach, um, another metaphor, we like metaphors because it's, it gives you a sense of um, how we work. Uh, we, we use the, the idea of an onion and really the work that we try to do is peeling the layers off the onion. So from the surface, which are the very explicit decisions, behaviors and actions, and then slowly, um, you know, along with feedback or other sources of information, peel back the layers to really try to um, step into the inner drivers uh, of an individual's behaviors. 
If you're interested in this approach, if you're not familiar with it, we have a writing on it. Um, Monty and I wrote an article on it. There's other, there are many different other articles on it. So when you get the slide back, you can always click on it and take you directly to the article. And then finally, um, an approach that we take to in all of, all of our tools is um, a systemic lens. So always at when as much as possible situating the leader within the context. Systemic means working considering the context. So the individual leader, um, the leader within the team, and then more broadly within the organization. Um, and that goes, even if we're working with a leader on a leadership, for example, the Global leader, Executive Leadership Mirror, it's a, it's a leadership development tool. In our conversations, we're not just only looking at the results of, of this individual, but we also bring in the idea of, you know, how do they interface with their peers or direct reports or superiors? So we're really looking at the broader context, using the information to also talk about interpersonal relationships, um, how they work with others, and also more globally about the culture. So I think in, in all of our tools, we try to work at, in, on multiple levels. Um, so by exploring the wider context, uh, we're able to understand more of the complexity of the individual within the system. And also we have a, another paper on that. As, as, because we're an institute, we like to write. And so we have a, we, we have a lot of writing on that. And I, I'm also aware that this is a very high level uh, introduction. So, um, so for those who want to dig deeper into it, we do have resources. So I'm going to pause here before I go into a specific tools per level. But are there any questions that you have for Lydia or I? You can raise your hands or just unmute and speak up. Or um, you could also add your questions to the chat as they come up. Yeah, for those who joined a little bit later, as Alicia mentioned, we'll be taking a few questions already here during the hour, but since there are many of us here, feel free to pop them in the chat and we will, uh, we will do a roundup after this call, send you the slides and the answers to all the questions you may have. Okay. Oh, yes, Alison. Hi, I go by Ali. Are you, are you, uh, you wouldn't know. Are you, are you going to be talking about how we can use this and whether we need to employ KDVI services or whether these are instruments that we can use as individual coaches? Yes. Thank you. Yes, we'll get into that. Um, yeah, we'll get into that in terms of training. So just to answer you, um, quickly answer, you don't need um, you don't need certification to use our, our tools. But we do offer training and certification programs for those who would like to um, build up the confidence in using the, the, the tools. And also because um, our, our certification programs have um, ICF credits attached to it. So it makes sense for some people to invest their time into taking the certification. But no, you don't need um, formal training, especially if you, I think also if, you, if you're comfortable using other tools, um, you know, it's really, you could do, I, we also try to build our tools in a way that's very easy to use so that it doesn't require training or a massive training to, to, you know, learn how to use the tool. So that, that was built into the way we design the tools, but we do offer support for, for those who just want to have um, a little bit of, you know, handholding before they actually use it, especially for something a bit more complicated, like the culture audit. I think Certain tools might require a little bit more hand holding. Okay. Any other questions before I move on? Well, there's there's one in the chat, mm -hmm. um, which is if we, we if we use a psychodynamic approach a, a psychodynamic approach. Sorry, how do you assess each person? Do you use an approved psychological assessment tool? No, actually, this. I, so I think when, what I mean by the psychodynamic dynamic approach is that this is what we we actually address in our certification program. So in in those training programs, we're not only teaching you well, going through um, the technical aspects of the tool, such as reading and interpreting the report, um, but also how would you debrief it in a in a more psychodynamic way. So I think that's what the, the training sort of. That added value of the training is that how would you use it in a psychodynamic way? 
Um, but there is an, it, it really is an approach, it's a mindset. I think for some of you here who have attended the CCC program at INSEAD, you've been exposed to it. It's a framework that we use. It's not necessarily built into, um, there's no evaluate, you know, there's no, um, there's not nothing within the tool itself that would indicate that you use it in a psychodynamic way. I think it's the way that you bring yourself as a coach into those conversations, uh, the lens that you bring in, in addition to other lenses that you might have depending on your training. And so this is one particular lens that we advocate or we um, within, our, within our company. Does that make sense? Um, Alessandro. Uh, good afternoon, uh, all. Hi, Alicia. Question mm -hmm. regarding how do you recommend to use the surveys uh, in uh, combination with qualitative uh, understanding of uh, the individual of the team, mainly like uh, social analytic uh, interviews or other different, uh, let's say, way to, to gather data about the people on a qualitative uh, base before integrating in a more structured, let's say, way as a, as a survey? Yeah, so usually in our practice, what we do is before we even use a tool, um, we have conversations. We can also, um, if we're working in a program uh, with, a, let's say, a leadership team, we usually uh, initiate the process with um, diagnostic interviews um, in the beginning, because that's the qualitative aspect. And that's also a more human way to engage with the people that are going to participate in the process. And then we use a 360 or a tool. So that's our sort of process. It's it's not something that's mandated, um, but um, we always always begin with where the client is. So a conversation, um, stakeholder interviews, uh, depending on how it's structured. Um, and also going back to and also we also where possible integrate um, other sources of information. So for example, if we're working with the organizational culture audit, uh, we can pull in let's say the organization's own values, or we can link it to their leadership um, 360s. So it, it again, it's a more holistic way and that's what I meant by systemic lens. So if we use a tool, it's only one facet of you know, the elephant and where possible, we're trying to bring in different sources of information. Um, having said that too, I think also when you debrief with the 360s, um, you know, when you're, when you're, if you're familiar with the 360s, with the leadership 360s, you're debriefing their results. But it's only one facet of that person that you're, be, you're working with. And so within the, those conversations, you can bring in, um, even during the debrief, you're actually talk, you're expanding the universe to talk about their work. And they bring in the information. They, they bring in the context into the conversations. And beyond that, if it's a 360, we also encourage them, if, if it's a safe space, that they bring the 360 back to their observers and continue the conversation. So it becomes a much more a living uh, process as opposed to just tied within that, that report itself. I think, and that's why I said, you know, in the beginning that quote, it's, it's really, it triggers this introspective journey. So by virtue of having a report, it triggers a, an opportunity to, have, to start the conversations with your you know, superior, direct reports, peers, um, but because you have you have something with which to start those those conversations. Okay. Oh, let me just keep track of time because we have a lot of <laughs> we have a lot of information. Lydia and I were just okay. Um, so here, really, again, I think just to summarize, really, we're looking at the system uh, a very, and this again, it's not it's not let's say folded within the instruments themselves. It's just trying to share with you the way we work with instruments. And I think that's the way, um, um, because we're not really interested in, in just you know, selling instruments. I think we're, we're interested in how do you use the instruments in a way to work meaningfully with the client. Um, and so I think that that's why for us, we started with this, it's the approach and the, and the minds and the lens that you take into those conversations. Um, so what's the slide and I think so um some, some overview of our design and development so that's all about tools or so the tools all these tools this family of tools are based on four decades of research so we're very lucky for Manfred to have you know be in at NCL so we really have that research academic 
uh, rigor background with us and also not just Manfred, but you know, people in the OB department. So I think it's really nice to have a sort of a, a, a link, a bridge into the academia. Um, but it's also it's based on research, but also um, you know, decades of working with, with um, leaders and organizations. So I think it's a really bottom-up and top-down approach. Um, and also when we designed the tools, we we also tested it out with um, leaders. So our pilot testing sort of took place at NCR. So we tested them out with actual leaders, um, you know, checking for language, um, whether it was relevant. So I think that's this two-way process of it being both academically driven, but also ground up from, from the lived experience of executives. Um, and then, so each instrument follows quite a rigorous, it's very process of design development and validation usually takes about a year. So I think I just wanted to illustrate this because it's not it's not where we sit down and come up with a bit of a number of questions and then we roll it out. I mean there is there is you know we try to anchor it in research, there's an iterative process, we identify dimensions, write questions, we validate, we pilot test, and then where possible we normalize and then we pilot test again. And then it keeps continuing. And then Liddy, he's the one that gets the feedback from users. We also have a list of you know, recommendations and period periodically we will revisit the instrument um, to see if we can make an, an improvements. Okay. Um, oh, I, I keep thinking that this section is over, but it isn't. <laughs> okay. Um, so our ethics. So how do we use our tools? And I think what I want to, um, uh, again, um, kind of highlight is that how do we frame the diagnostic process? It's, we try to steer away from being, it being a very judgmental um, exercise. Um, because sometimes when you look at parts, there's a judgment that comes with it. Or if you look at normalized results, you're being compared to you know, a, a reference group. I think with these tools, we're really trying to use it as a sense-making tool. It's really focused on development rather than assessment. Uh, we try to create an open environment for critical and honest feedback. So it's really about personal development and, and uh, akin to that is really engaging the person in the process and that person also engaging the observers if it's a 360 in the process of, of development rather than assessment. Uh, we seek also broad organization engagement. Um, so a lot of times, and this actually goes to, um, that's relevant to the organizational culture audit. When we work with culture, we, we ideally we want to ensure that the leadership team um, are on board with the process. Um, and I'll go, I'll go into it in more detail um, when we talk about the instrument. So really about um, engagement, um, because engagement and along with engagement comes ownership, because in the end, they have to take ownership for their own development. Um, participation in the process is voluntary and the responses are confidential unless agreed upon. So confidentiality is very important. If you have any question about, you know, what we do with the information, the data, um, Liddy can answer that or we can answer that um, in a, a subsequent follow up. And how we work with a client is that we develop a relationship with neutral Instagram. Uh, the, the clients or play an active role in sense making. So we don't come in with the answers. We come in with the results and we help them make sense of the results together. So we ask questions, we probe them, we, we, we get them to think more deeply about the questions, uh, the, the results. Uh, we focus both on strengths and areas of development. In our, in our practice, we tend to see people zo zooming in on negative or critical feedback. I think part of this process too is also, as I mentioned, the blind spots. Sometimes the blind spots are hidden strengths and people are not aware of it and they might not necessarily capitalize on it. So I think having a more balanced approach of looking on, uh, looking on strengths as well as areas of development. And also part of our role, you know, especially when we have 360 feedback, it can be quite, um, depending on the feedback, it can create, um, it can generate emotional reactions or defenses. And so part of our work is to help them work, stay with those emotions and work through those emotions and, and address them um, with them together. 
So actually, this is the end of the first section. I actually ended too quickly. <laughs> Any questions before I, I, I provide an overview of the um, Maria, do you have your hand up or is that just the pencil? Okay. Yes, I do. Hello. <laughs> it's the pencil that is my hand. <laughs> Um, hi, Alicia. And Hello. Hi, Lydia, and hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I have a question on these sort of 360s. Um, like, how, how do you, or is there is there something in your tools that uh, helps people decide who to actually ask, um, you know, to give feedback? Because I've now had one or two cases where um, people either you know, sort of romanticize themselves by asking only people who are like super positive. Yeah. Or they even go to the length of literally bribing people to say positive things. I mean, how do you deal with that kind of thing? I think that, that comes in, in the beginning of the contracting with the with the client. What's the purpose of this process? So is it just, you know, are they, are they interested, are they truly interested in developmental feedback or is it just an exercise of, you know, um, picking, picking a box or, you know, as I said, the assessment, that assessment part. So what you're saying sounds like, you know, that it's framed in sort of assessment, I need to get the good grades, I need to come up looking good. But, and that's why I think in our approach, it's more, um, you know, taking away the fear of the assessment. Again, it depends on, why the 360 is being embedded within that process um, from the H, you know, from the HR. But usually the way we work with is just individual development. So it's really having them use this opportunity. Uh, what we do too is because we have some sample slides, you know, showing, you know, if you have feedback from yourself, what it, what the report would look like and what a what a richer report would look like, how enriched it would be when you have 360. And I think then it shows people that, you know, I'm going through this exercise. I might as well use that opportunity to get us, you know, it's for myself. And that's where, again, I think the, the ownership comes in, the engagement and ownership, even prior to using the, the tool. Um, yeah, super answer. Thank you, Alicia. Um, okay. So I'm um, going to go through this. Oops. What did I say? I can't. I have a minute. Leadership development. So, uh, so this work. So I'm going to go through the three levels: leadership, leadership. So individual leadership development, team development, and and culture. So leadership development. Um, we have, you know, um, as mentioned, you know, we, um, Alessandra, we we do have leadership audit interviews. Um, so these are in-depth conversations with key stakeholders, um, to outline some development priorities for them. Um, and then these are some of our, you know, we have a protocol and these are some of the areas we address. So, and then alongside, we have a number of 360s. Just to let you know that sometimes we just do the leadership development interviews. We can do a 360 leadership development interview, not even have a 360 tool um, because it depends because, you know, if it's with a board member or the CEO, it's more, it's more, it's one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, it's a little bit more um, high touch. To have those conversations so you don't necessarily have to use those 360 you could do we and we've done it where we've done it with the leadership team we did it the 360 completely with interviews um and then wrote a report out of that so i think it, again it, it's a you start with where they are and what they're open to um and there's no sort of one route but i think what we have here is sort of a toolkit where you can pick and choose according to the client's needs um, so at the leadership level, we have three tools, um, three feedback tools. We have the Global Executive Leadership Mirror, which looks at effective leadership behaviors. Um, I think I, I do go through it, yeah, in more detail. Um, so that really looks at leadership behaviors, um, anchored in leadership behaviors. Then at a deeper level, uh, we also have the inner theater inventory. And actually, this is probably our most likely dynamic tool because it do, it's really packed into um, is trying to sort of visualize um, what are the core drivers uh, in an individual's lives. And I think a lot of times it's, it's really related to very basic things like are you driven by autonomy or learning or, um, or uh, some of the other care. So really foundational values that govern your behavior. Um, and so 
it's it's often used alongside um, leadership too. If you want to delve more deeply into their belief systems and their inner drivers and motivations, and then we also have a personality audit to really, and that tool is really to understand interpersonal relationships. So we're looking at your dominant personality styles, and then how that might create conflict or result in harmony with certain you know, other individuals. So it's really helping you identify areas of inter your interpersonal relationships, helping you understand why some function and some are, are more challenging. Um, so more, and again, for each of them, I've tried to make this very simple for you. Um, if there's a, if it's in red, it's a link and it'll bring you, and you'll have more information you can read on, up on it. And then also there's additional readings as well. But it just gives you a sense of the dimensions that are covered uh, for each of the tool. So you'll see, you know, with um, the DLM, it's really very anchored in the business world, right? In the working life. So um, how do you lead yourself? How do you lead teams? How do you lead the organizations and networks, leveraging networks? Um, but also very, I think, um, sort of, yeah, because this, this thing, this, this, um, this tool was designed even pre-COVID. And what we've noticed is that with COVID times now, I mean, I think the, this area of the life indicators of life stresses and well-being resources are, is becoming more resonant uh, with leaders to explore. So we, not, we look not only on explicit behaviors, leadership behaviors, but we also explore um, sort of more of the, 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 you know, how much the stress levels, and what their coping mechanisms are. So that can be also be weaved into your co uh, conversations. And then we also try to tie it to perceptions of uh, performance, so not real measures of it, but just how well are they, you know, how well do they perceive themselves to achieve their, their objectives as well as developing people. And then here you'll see with the ITI, these are sort of the core drivers. And I think here, Depending on the work that you're doing with your client, um, you know, here you see that it's really going into the fundamental values of an individual. Um, and what you can use this for is you're really trying to find congruence between your values and your work. Um, because sometimes there's tensions and frustrations. And if you go back to your core values, maybe then you'll be able to understand why there are tensions within your work, within your working life, and whether there are some changes that have to be made. Um, to find more harmony uh, between the different sets of values. And then um, where you see the, the PA, the personal audit, it, that is actually based also on the big five, um, if, if you're aware of the big five personality traits. Again, it just shows you how different people work, you know, whether you're um, more conscientious or lazy there, because the way you work, or your dominant traits might come into conflict with someone else's traits or might create misunderstanding uh, with someone else's um, uh, personality traits. So that again, an exercise of increasing self-awareness and awareness of others. Okay. So any questions for the individual tools? Yes, we have a question from Ali who's asking, what makes the GLM global? Would it apply to for a national, nationally based startup company? It will, um, I, you know, I don't, well, Liddy, I mean, I think Liddy, you have a sense of who our clients are. I think we've used it with a very broad range of clients. Um, it, is, it is, I think where it might not work so well is if you are, because it's, the, the categories are defined in a way where it's more of a traditional hierarchical uh, structure with the superior direct reports and peers and others. So in that sense, the categories might create, you know, if you're, you're, if you're a, a freelance or depending on your work, it might not be as relevant. Um, so I, that's, that's, a, that's the only area where I think that might create um, some sort of distance and another tool might be better for that. And also, I think it's important to know, so in what context can we use the tool? Because this tool is not going to be applicable to everything. I think we, that's, again, we, we start with where the, uh, the, the, the individual is. And the tool is, the GLM is basically used in, an, in, in a context where you have a superior or direct reports or, you know, those types of categories of um, 
people that you work with. Um, also, um, all our tools have qualitative feedback. And also that is also a section of all our instruments that we, we, we really work with and we advocate because that's where you get very client specific nuanced feedback. And there's, so it's also feedback from the individuals, you know, the observers themselves. So some of the things that might not be captured in those predefined um, categories can come up in those comments. And so we work alongside those things. I mean, with any instrument, there are always choices. You can't have a hundred dimensions. So I think we had to narrow it down. The dimensions are the, um, just to let you know, if, if you click on those links, um, the GLM was based on research on, um, you know, effective, glo effective global leadership, as well as we also looked at um, best, best places to work, Glassdoor reviews, they do a best places to work a review or synthesis. So that's more ground up. So what are people saying within companies that make them good places to work or what are the qualities? So I think it's, it's again, trying to find a balance. This tool is not gonna cover everything, but I think how we work around it is, the, is through the comments, um, which also lends a, you know, a more human side to the tool um, because they're actually um, feedback from individuals. Does that answer your question? Or oh, maybe raises more questions? <laughs> Any, any other questions before I move to the team tools? So we did have another question from Alessandro um, who's asking, how do these tools consider the specific life cycle of the organization where the person taking the survey, where the person's taking the survey work? Hmm, very good question. I think what we do is that we, um, we do that through the debrief. Well, I mean, through first talk, first of all, with the initial conversation, why are you taking this tool? You know, why are you going through this 360 feedback? What is what is your situation? Are you transitioning into um, another role? Are you thinking of, you know, it, has it been imposed on you too? So I think the context is really important, even before using the tool. And also when we, when we debrief the tool, uh, we don't just present the report. I think the, the conversation always starts with where they are, you know, what's their life cycle? Where's the trajectory? What are their goals? And then within that, then we then we use the results and weave that into the uh, into the conversations. So it's not a standard, I just debrief the results, you're high on this, you're low on this. I think it starts from where are you? Where do you want to be? What are you struggling with? Uh, a lot of times too, even as a prep work, uh, uh, and I think Manfred uses that too, he asks them to, before even um, alongside the, the GLM, he asks them to write a leadership challenge, a challenge that they face at work. So it's concrete. It's concrete, it's anchored in their everyday reality. And so you could always, with the results, you can refer back to a case or you could bring in other cases through the conversation. So again, it's not, it's not a closed system. I think the tool itself is, the goal is to open it up, open up the conversations and bring in um, other contextual information. Does that make sense? It does. Thank you, Alicia. Okay, so um, I'm going to move on to team development. So, um, so with team development, again, similarly, we've got these interviews that we do. We have um, we have a protocol uh, um, for 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 speaking with the teams. Vasiar has experienced that uh, with his with his organization. So these are interviews again. Again, it's very bespoke. I mean, we have a, a list of questions, but it's also bespoke. So again, we weave in the questions that the organization wants to explore. But it's also a very human way of engaging in the process. You know, instead of receiving a link to take a survey. Um, and a lot of times through those conversations, and, and a lot of times these conversations, they're actually interviews, but they're also conversations. It's also, um, we call them semi-structured. And we have a structure, but we're also, in some ways, it's also a, a coaching conversation because, you know, we ask questions, they're follow-ups. And through that, you're trying to also unpack and sense-make through, um, through those conversations. It's, for us, it's an intervention in itself, those interviews. Um, we have an immersive simulation, the Palau simulation. 
Um, so it's an experiment, experiential learning experience that takes place over a day, focuses on group dynamics. So it looks not only on, um, so the idea is that there are different stakeholder groups, so they have to work well, you know, it, it's about inter-team dynamics within the team, and it also is also about intergroup dynamics. And then more broadly, it's about um, systemic. So how do you, as multiple stakeholder groups, work towards a win-win solution? So again, working at different levels and exploring dynamics at different levels. It's more complex. Sometimes it's nice because I think, you know, there is there, sometimes you can have a survey overkill, too many surveys. And so um, a simulation, and I think especially when you're working with teams and group dynamics or team dynamics, a simulation is a really great way um, to, to play them out, you know, to have them come out, bring them out to the surface and then debrief. So it's an alternative way uh, to a, a, a sort of a free, you know, um, uh, an online survey, it's something to think about for people who are, who want a little bit more, more interactivity or, you know, a, a different approach to looking at, um, dynamics. So we have uh, amongst the within the team um, development, we've got the leadership archetype questionnaire, which looks at team roles. Um, the idea being that, so Manfred has written, a, a, you know, he always says leadership is a team sport. So, and the idea that, you know, with a great man theory, no one individual can fulfill all the roles. The idea is to create a team that fulfills multiple roles. So this tool is is an attempt to map what the different strengths of the team are and to look at what the gaps are. Um, but also it's a way to also acknowledge that, you know, certain team members have certain strengths and to acknowledge that and to work off that and that you yourself have a, have a particular strength. So it's also a team development exercise. We also have an international directory inventory that's also used at, uh, used at INSEA, but used at the board level. So we're, this one is really designed for board um, roles within the board. So more specific to board work. And finally, we have a high performing team dynamics tool. So this looks at team dynamics and um, you know, how the team is operating. So if you wanna go more into detail on the, the, the dynamics within the team. So if I had to summarize, it's just roles and, and dynamics that they can be categorized into those. So um, an overview of the Palau, we have additional information if you're interested. Actually, at the end of the session, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open up a, a, a um, Mensimeter. So if you, if you have an interest in a particular uh, service, um, please note them down in this exercise. Then Libby and I can think of a follow-up, let's say session. Um, for the, you know, if there's a particular service that garners a lot of interest, we could also design another information session, a more detailed information or session on those services. So it's a live simulation, um, but I think I just wanted to just emphasize um, how you could use the simulation. So you can use it to address systemic issues, group dynamics, and also below the surface issues. So that's a tool that can be used to uh, be brought in. Um, to conversations around team functioning. Um, and then this one, this just gives you an overview of the, the other three team tools and the dimensions that are, that are covered. Um, any questions? It's a lot of information, but I think this, that was the point of this. It's an overview, but if you're all, if you're interested in it, you know, delving deeper into one particular tool, you can always contact Lydia or myself uh, for a longer conversation. Okay, um, ooh, 10 minutes, okay. Finally, organizations. Um, so we have the interviews, same, same old, same old. Um, and then these are the areas that we can cover in it. Um, but then we also have uh, the organization culture audit, which I think is the more, more, more com most complex tool because it, um, and, and that doesn't require formal training, but I'm always here to support you. If, you, if you're interested in it, we can always have a conversation uh, around how to use it. Um, and these are the, the values, the cultural values. So the OCA, it's not a, um, how would I say? It is not a uh, 
pulse survey. I think what, what we use the OCA for of the organizational culture audit is a sense making tool with the leadership team. So it operates on both levels, looking at the culture, but also working with the leadership team to align them as a team around the culture. So it's it's usually akin to a team intervention, a senior leadership team in the with the focus not on their dynamics, but on the culture. Um, and what we do is the way it's structured is that we're looking at um, what it measures is, or what it tries to reveal is the gaps, I think, between you know stated values, what you have on your webpage, and how and lift culture, how people actually live out those values. So it's really trying to look for the gaps between um, values and practice. And we've also, uh, we look at the values in, in two ways. There are a set of performance related values and people related values. The way we use this tool is not, not so much to say, you know, if you have these set of values, you'll be successful. I think the way we use this oftentimes is to balance both of them. Um, and a lot of times what we see is that a lot of the companies have performance related values, but they don't pay attention to the people related values. And these are the areas that are actually undermining their ability to achieve the results. So I think it's more about creating awareness uh, that you need to find that balance that even though uh, a value like fun might not be explicitly advocated, um, but we often see in the survey that it's practiced much more, much impact is much higher and it's often a reaction to the stress that people encounter. So I think a lot of times the, the tool is very interesting in that in the sense it's trying to find equilibrium between these two areas. Um, okay, and then um, one last piece before I end, uh, uh, before I move into the training. So for each of our instruments, we also do additional data analysis. Um, and, and why I say that is because the tool, uh, as Andrew, you mentioned, there might be other sources of information. How do you weave that in? Um, we can also do group level analysis, which is really, love. I love this one because, for example, with the GLM, if you use it with a leadership team, you can, you can apply a group level analysis. You can look at the, the group charts, and then you can look at all the comments. And from there, you can actually deduce um, things that are happening within the system. So you can actually really address not only the work at the individual level, but you can also bring in systemic issues. If you see certain patterns reoccur across the, the leadership reports, it can tell you something about the country. So again, really taking a more systemic lens when we look at each tool, it's not just at one level, but how can we connect it to interpersonal relationships? How can we connect it to the system? Um, we also do comparative. Um, longitudinal analysis, so we can retake the GLM or retake the OCA uh, at different points of time to see if there are shifts. Mindful also that there might be other factors responsible for the shifts, but it's also you could retake, that's an option that you could retake a, a, a tool. You could also compare, again, like drawing in different um, sources of information. So, for example, the OCA has a set of 12 defined dimensions, but an organization might have their own, let's say, list of dimensions. And oftentimes what we see is that we can actually match, um, often match their dimensions to one of our 12 or to match them to the comments. So, um, so that's a nice way to create an, uh, a bridge between um, the results and what's happening within the things that are particular or specific to their organization. Uh, we, we can do benchmarks and then also thematic analysis. And thematic analysis is, I think, the area that we, we really love working with because it's about patterns, recurring patterns, um, and, and what we can deduce from that. Any questions? Before yeah, I have one question from, uh, from Ali, and there's just a second one that came in from Alessandra. So the first one from Ali is about separating the different stakeholder groups in the OCA. And yes, we can do that. We can um, actually include, include it in the base price of the OCA. You'll have the opportunity to put in one question with up to six different answers or categories under that question. And then you can add on, uh, you can add on more. And then it's just a question of making sense of how many questions are interesting to have, but that is a possibility. And it splits out within the report, it will split out all the results per, for the whole group and then per category. 
on, on our website, you can all, uh, you can download a, a sample report for each of the tool. So it gives you a sense of what it looks like. Um, if this, you know, addition, if you have, again, um, more questions, you can always contact us um, individually. And Alessandra's question is, um, is the team simulation based on a fictional case or can it be used in a real team project? Well, it is a, it is a fictional case. So um, yeah, it is a fictional case. But what happens in the debrief is that we, uh, we identify the dynamics and then the, usually the debrief is two parts. We look at the case and the dynamics that come out of that experience. Then the next part is having the, that information, bringing it back to their own um, organization or the team context. So, but at least they, they have, again, some, some information with which to work similarly like the GLM or any of our tools. You, you have a one, you know, have a some, you have um, some information and then you bring in the context, you weave in the context in your debrief and your further conversations. Um, and then finally, just um, go back to the questions on, on training, and then, then I'm going to open it up for more general questions. So we, we provide, um, again, we're not a certified, we're not interested in certified people, but we do this because people come to us and say, we need help. So that's why we offer these services, but that's not, that's not really our goal to be a, 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 a certification body. But we do, if you, if you, you know, want to build up your confidence, if you want to learn about a psychodynamic approach, uh, we do offer certifications. So we've got three certification programs. Um, we have some alumni in this, in this session. So we've got the GLM. So again, all of them weaved into all of them are also our approach. So it's not just technical aspect, but how do we use it with, with a particular lens? So how do we work deeply at a deeper level with each, with each of the tool that we have with what they were going through? And then we also have the psychodynamic group coaching practicum, and that one focuses on the our psychodynamic group coaching approach. Um, and I see, I see Marianne there. She's one of our alumni. So this is a, a much longer program, but really it's it's really one of our flagship programs to really try to um, well give people the opportunity to practice this in a safe environment in a group coaching environment, as opposed to just going out there and, and, and testing it out. So, you know, um, Mary, oh, contact my, oh, myself, but you really get to practice it. Um, and I think that's for how you learn, learning through practice. It's, it can be stressful, but it's a, it's a rich learning experience and, and um, there's also supervision. So you're actually guided through the process with, with coaches that, that help you through the process. And finally, we also provide uh, one to one. So both those are group uh, training sessions, uh, certification sessions. But for those people who want to get off the ground immediately, or if they have a client next week and they say, we need help, we also provide a one to one training um, and certification. So, what's the difference between training and certification? Training, we give you the foundation, we give you, you know, you get the foundations, how we design the tool, we go through a feedback report make sure you understand the results. Uh, and then you also go through a personal debrief. So you experience what it is like, um, you know, to receive the feedback. How would you deliver a feedback? And then that all, all of these programs come with credits. The advanced certification requires that you use it with a client and, and write a reflection paper, because then that, that is the way that we can ascertain that you've actually used it and then reflected on it and, and learned from that journey. So that's the difference between uh, just training, get you off the ground, and versus certification where you're actually using it with a client and you get feedback on that process. And then we also support you in um, you know, um, interpreting the results uh, with, with the client. So that's it. And I want to open it up to, um, to questions. And also, if you could type into the chat, are there any particular service? I know because this is an overview and we went through a lot of information. Um, if there are particular services or overviews that you would like more information, I can provide Lydia and I, um, because we could always do a follow-up session on one or two particular tools that are of interest to you. Or you could always send us uh, an email um, after reflecting on that. So I'm going to stop the share and open it up um, the last few minutes. Last minute, if you have any questions. No. 
Is it a lot of, it's a lot of information, I feel. <laughs> Alicia, thank you very much, if I can. Yes. Yeah, thank you very much for the overview. Um, for me, it would be interesting to have a sort of um, debrief session in one of the tools uh, to see how do you really um, create value out of, uh, of the assessment of the understanding of uh, uh, an eventual survey, either done at, at middle level or a team or at organizational level, just to see and to grasp uh, how can you build on, on those data in order to drive an eventual conversation with the team or with the individual or with the organization. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I could, I mean, I think top of mind, I think, you know, for example, I could do a, a case study on a GLM and how would you work with it in a psychodynamic way? So that's all the OCA. So um, uh, yeah, if you could type it out on the chat, I mean, I what, yeah, for collectively, um, then, then we'll, we can gauge um, what we can as a, as a useful follow-up or, uh, you know, continuation of the series. Uh, because okay. we're, we're mindful that, that we have a lot of information, <laughs> but we also want to cater to the broader needs. And yeah, so I'm just going to, there's, there is another question here, but uh, just to repeat to everyone, feel free to just drop a line, anything that you're interested in, and we'll capture that and we'll come put it all together and make sense of it. But the question to respond to Thierry uh, Brunel, who entered the question about training for the ITI, yes, we, it's not, it wasn't on Alicia's slide, but any of our tools, uh, if you're interested in it, uh, we can offer, we can put together some the training, like the basic six hour, three times one and a half hours training uh, with, uh, with one of the associates, Alicia or one of the associates uh, to, yeah, to teach you. So that's, we do get in touch with us. Yes, um, we can send the recording. So yeah, as the follow up, we'll send the slides, the recording and um, answers to any of the questions that you've put in the chat. And of course, our website has a lot of information. <laughs> so and we'll, we do, we'll send you a link to the, the tools website because you can also order it online. Um, there's readings. Um, yeah. That's a you lot can email, email me if you've got any, and email me and or Alicia um, or an email on the website. It will get to us. Uh, and we'll come back to you. Um, yes, there are a few more questions that have popped up and I can give you a quick answer to, to, uh, for, for, to your question, Ali, about the self version. So we offer self-assessment for the GLM, although it's not, it's possible. We do offer it. We do have a way of presenting self-only results for the GLM properly. Um, we don't really indicate it in for the other tools because otherwise it doesn't make very much sense. It's very light but the GLM can be used like that. Mm. And the frequency of the trainings, well, the group trainings, we try to aim for certain dates during the year, but we've noticed that most of our recent trainings have been one-to-ones and they're absolutely uh, whenever you're ready to do it. And someone at KDVI can, can support you. So which is, we've got a quick turnaround with one-to-one -one trainings. It's pretty, pretty easy to, to set up. And the cost of the trainings, well, I'll get back to you and see if you want to know more about the ICI training. Um, the cost of the group trainings are all on our website. So again, we'll, we'll consolidate that. But then, um, yeah, the cost of the individual, um, Liddy has those, that information. Yeah, we have, we're in the process of just merging all this information on the website. So apologies, if you can't find all the information, we're going to melt it all down and put it back up nicely on the website so that it's clear um, for group one-to-ones, training, certification, so yeah. But I can provide all that by email. So I'm mindful that we're at time, so um, Lydia and I can stay on for those who have additional questions, but thank you very much for attending the session. Uh, if you have questions, again, we're available um, to take them. Um, and please stay in touch. Yep, thank you all for being here.